Okay. We ready? Good. Beautiful. So, I don't think I actually need to tell you this story. Like, this is one of those stories that <clears throat> I don't remember actually learning this story. I've just always had it. It's just in my head. You know, it's just, I, it's just a story. And I'm guessing that for those of you sitting here, it's the same way. But just so we're on the same page, let's go ahead and do it anyway. So one day, Jesus uh, and his disciples needed to cross the Sea of Galilee. They needed to get from one side to another for ministerial purposes. Jesus had, you know, business on one side, and then he had business on the next side, the other, like, the next day. And so uh, in, in the evening, they decided, okay, let's go ahead and cross the Sea of Galilee. Now, we have to understand that crossing the Sea of Galilee for them is no big deal. This is like driving to Columbia for us. Like, it's just not a thing. They do it all the time. And especially with Jesus' disciples, uh, you know, they're like half of them are fishermen, it feels like. And so uh, the, the ones who aren't fishermen, they just grew up around it. You know, they're just a, a thing that they do. They all are used to being on a boat. They're used to being specifically on this body of water. It's no big deal. So there is absolutely nothing that is, you know, noteworthy or significant about them crossing the sea on this particular evening, which probably helpfully explains why Jesus does what he does. Jesus gets in the boat. He tells his disciples, guys, I'm going to bed. See you tomorrow. And he goes to the back of the boat. <laughs> and he gets a pillow, and he lays his head down. And he goes to sleep. And, like, he's asleep like that. Some of us are not great at falling asleep. That is not Jesus. Jesus is not counting even a single sheep. He is just out like a light. And so he goes to sleep. You can imagine it. Cute little Jesus in the back, fetal position with the pillow. Night, night. And that's all it is. They're just crossing the sea. They do it all the time. Except, you know, it's normal until it's not. And this particular night, it starts storming. You know, again, a storm is no big deal. There's storms all over the Sea of Galilee. There's storms all over the, the you know, the, I mean, like, if you're a fisherman, like, you don't go out and be like, well, today I won't go fishing because it's raining. You know, like, it's not what you do. You know, they're used to dealing with storms. They're used to dealing with lightning and thunder and waves. And, and the, it's just life. It's life living by a sea. It's life as these sorts of people. Except the thing is, with this storm, it, it got bad. It was This is a bad storm. Um, now, how bad is a whole topic of conversation we're going to go into during this whole thing? But it gets bad enough that the disciples start getting a little anxious. The, the waves are, are crashing, and the, the, the lightning is going, and the thunder is very noisy, and there's rain everywhere. And uh, the, the story tells us that, that water starts sloshing in over the sides, and so now the boat is taking in water, and it's just... It's a whole mess. And so the disciples now, all of the disciples are fighting. They're, they're, you know, if you can imagine, they've got the buckets, and they're trying to bucket the water out, and somebody's doing something to the sail. I, I don't know. I've watched a lot of pirate movies, but I have no idea what they're doing. Somebody's swabbing the poop deck. Like, I don't know what that is, but they're swabbing it. I don't know what swabbing it is. I don't know any of it. I just know that I've heard that term in pirate movies for a long time. So somebody's probably doing that. Um, you know, it's just, all, it's, they're, they're doing everything they can, and they're doing everything they can to kind of get through the the storm. And Jesus is adorably on his pillow, fetal position, just sleeping. And so things start getting out of hand, and they're taking out water, and it's about the time that maybe the water is like ankle high. I don't know, whatever it is. It's, it's starting to freak everybody out. And the disciples do, you know, they decide that they need to find the guy that they lean on when they freak out. And it's Jesus, who's still sleeping. The Son of God cannot be accused of being a light sleeper. He is just sleeping through this whole thing. And so the disciples go, and they wake him up. And, and he's, I mean, he's like deep sleep. He's dreaming. Like he's REM sleep. He's, I mean, he's that like, you know, like in the middle of the night, and you, you woke up, like you wake up, and you're not sure like what day it is. And you're not sure what time it is, and you check, and it's like, it's three. I still have a couple hours. Great. And you know, it's like that kind of like waking up in the middle of the night. That's Jesus. And the disciples, they, 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 they come at him not with like, you know, they're panicking. So they're not like, oh, Jesus, could you please help us? Instead, they say, Jesus, Jesus, man, why do you not care that we're all going to drown? Is how they address Jesus. And I think if you got woken up in the middle of the night, like maybe by your kids, 
with an accusation of why don't you care, you might understand why Jesus was a little bit annoyed with the situation. And so the Bible just tells us, like, the Bi- it's, it's funny, like, the way it's written, you know, it's written in, like, it, it's in a different language, we've translated it, and so, you know, th- at this point, it's, it, the, the Bible's kind of a little sterile about how it tells us what happened. So let me just tell you what I think happened here, okay? So Jesus is asleep, and his disciples are now yelling at him, and he kind of groggily wakes up, and he's like, have a sleep, and he's like, what? And he sees there's a storm, and he sees that like his disciples are yelling at him. And so Jesus yells at the storm, hey, pipe down. And the storm pipes down. And then Jesus looks at his disciples. He's like, guys, why don't you have any faith at all? I'm going back to sleep. And like that, Jesus is out like a light, sleeping, cute on his pillow, fetal position. The storm is calmed. Everything is good. Jesus is asleep again, having piped down the storm. The Bible says he rebuked the wind and the waves. That's yelling a pipe down. And the disciples, are they're not like, oh, cool, Jesus, is that, that was pretty neat. Uh, better listen to him and trust him next time. Instead, uh, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified. Of Jesus. They're like, man, what, like, who is this guy who's controlling the storm and the weather? And who is this guy that can just yell at a storm and it stops? They are terrified of Jesus. And that's the end of the story. Now, that's a story, again, I, I don't think I needed to tell you that. I think I could have just said, hey, you know that time that Jesus calmed the storm? And you guys have been like, yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, cool, let's talk about that. Like, I could have just done that. Because this is one of those stories, like I said, I don't remember learning this story. I've just always, like, you know, it, there's just some miracles, like Jesus feeding the 5,000 and Jesus, you know, healing lepers and Jesus raising the dead. Like, like this is just in that category of, of miracle, of Jesus' story that we just know. And it's not just me. It's not just, you know, uh, in case you're like, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Just know this, that, like, over the last couple thousand years, this is one of the most commonly depicted stories in, like, like ancient art. And the way ancient art used to work is the church would like order different artists to, to paint things because the church has always been lovely. And so they would tell artists like, hey, you're good at this. Why not use your creativity to do what we tell you? And they would tell them like, you know, paint these paintings. And so this is just one of those paintings like we see like just like dozens of examples of this, this being painted again and again and again. This is just one of those stories that everybody always wants everyone to know. It's a really, really like iconic, important, um, you know, sort of a microcosm of who Jesus is, kind of a miracle. I think that's a little bit odd. Like I think it's a little strange. I think if we think about this, if we take a step back, And think about this miracle, Jesus calming the storm. And we just sort of talked about a couple of details. I think we can kind of see how this is weird. You see, there's there's, there's something that, there's like a through line with all of the miracles of Jesus that are really, really important to us. There's there's like there's commonalities in, in the miracles that Jesus does that are, you know, okay, so the feeding of the 5,000. We're not going to talk about that because you know it. It's in every gospel. It's sort of like Jesus 101. But if we think about that story, w- what does that story do? Okay, first there's, there's, a, there's an impossible thing that Jesus is doing. It's an impossible thing. You don't just take one sack lunch and feed, you know, 5,000 men and all the children and all the women with, with that food. Like that's thousands and thousands of people that Jesus is feeding with one sack. Like, that's impossible. That's not how food works. That's not how, you know, physical objects works. That's a miracle that's uh, literally doing an impossible thing, right? And he's doing that because he has a need for these people. Like, they, he's serving people. He's doing them, some, he's doing something good for them on their behalf that they can't do for themselves, and as a result, people believe in him. Actually, if, if you read the book of John, you'll find out people believe in him so much, they won't leave him alone. 
<laughs> like they keep cha- like following him and chasing him. And like this miracle is so powerful because the people keep following him because they want more. They want more food. They want more miracles. They want more stuff. That's what we think of with Jesus' miracles. When we think of Jesus' miracles, he's doing the impossible. He's doing it for people. And he's doing it in a way that elicits faith. That you can do this with all of us. So the raising the dead, same thing. Dead people don't raise on their own, right? The guy he's doing it for, well, he was dead. That's pretty obvious. And then that guy totally believes in him, and so does everyone else who hears it, right? Like, we can keep going. The lepers, the same way. Like, leprosy doesn't heal itself. They're at, you know, there is no, there's no anything for leprosy. Like, if you get leprosy, I'm sorry, your foot's just going to fall off. That's the way life works, you know? And, and so then, again, so, you know, it's an impossible thing. He does it. It helps somebody with leprosy. Now they have both feet still, and it elicits faith. Every one of Jesus' miracles follows this pattern, an impossible thing for people, and it elicits faith. Except the calming of the storm doesn't do any of that. The calming of the storm, let's start here. Jesus only sort of does a miracle here. You know what storms do? They calm themselves. They self-soothe. If you let them cry it out, they'll be fine. Every storm you have experienced in your life began, did its thing, and then stopped on its own. If Jesus had not calmed the storm, you know what would have happened with the storm? It had died out. It would have been fine. Okay, fine. So Jesus can control the weather. Great. Fun cool. But he doesn't even need to. This is not meeting a felt need for anyone. He's not doing this impossible thing. He's, I, I guess you could say like maybe he's speeding up time a little bit with the storm or I, mean, I don't like however you want to think about it, but understand like this is fundamentally different than like bringing somebody back from the dead. If you bring somebody back from the dead, they're not going to come back from the dead without intervention, right? It's fundamentally different than feeding 5,000 because they're not going to get fed without intervention. Without intervention, this storm goes away on its own like all the other storms that have ever existed. It's not that great of a miracle. Well, maybe it helps the disciples. I mean, it helps them to get their panties out of a wad, maybe. But when you think about it, like, here's Jesus. When he says, don't you guys have faith, he means that literally. Think about this. The disciples go to Jesus, and this is their position. That Jesus, A, doesn't care about them. B, so much so that he will let them die. And C, on a boat that will apparently go down with Jesus on it. I mean, think about the logic here. When Jesus says, don't you have faith, what Jesus meant was, Hey, idiots, do you really think you're in danger right now? Newsflash, this is in Mark chapter 4. This is in Matthew chapter 8. This is in Luke chapter 8. And I know the story hasn't been written, so they don't understand. But that's why Jesus is saying, trust me. Like, there's 16 chapters in Mark. There's 28 in, in, in Matthew. There's uh, 24 in Luke. We're like... Eh, a third of the way, a fourth of the way through the story. Jesus is not going down with the ship. He is not going to die here. The disciples are not going to die this way. He's told them they're going to die. Great, but not like this. They got scared. But getting scared does not mean they deserve a miracle. He's not actually helping them. If Jesus had slept through the whole thing, maybe we've got some boat damage. I don't know. But everything was going to be okay. That's why Jesus kept sleeping. (laughs) Don't you think Jesus would have woken up if there was real danger? And so the third thing, it elicits faith. This miracle doesn't do that. 
The disciples are scared of Jesus. No, really, like, it's funny because Jesus is like, don't be afraid. Literally, if you look at the text, it says, like, don't be afraid, guys. And then the next sentence is, and then the disciples were afraid. (laughs) This miracle doesn't help their peace of mind. It doesn't help alleviate their fear. They are terrified of Jesus. Why? Is this miracle? Like, I can accept that this story exists. Like, I can accept that this happened. This actually, I feel like a variation of this theme happened a whole lot, and they just didn't write it down. Like, the disciples freak out about something. Jesus does a miracle to, like, make them shut up. And then he wants to get some sleep. And so I'll do this miracle. Let me get some sleep. We'll talk about it in the morning. And then the the disciples are terrified because, well, that was scary. Like, I could believe that that happens on a weekly basis. Because if I was a disciple, I would freak out all the time. I would be like, Jesus, don't you care? Because that's how I am. And then when Jesus does a miracle, giving me the thing I was asking for, I'd be like, whoa, that was too much. That was freaky. Because that's how I am. I totally buy that this story happened. I guess my big question is this. Why is this story so beloved? Why is this story something I never learned? Why is this on like, like if you were to make like a Mount Rushmore of Jesus' miracles, probably on it. Like if you were trying to explain who Jesus is, with just, and you're like, look, you get four miracles on the cross. This is probably one of them at least judging by, like, what we teach in Sunday school and, you know, what, in, what we learn in, in history and everything else. Why? I think we need to just pull back a little bit more. And we can see something that we don't often think about, but we really, really should. And there's a couple passages of Scripture, I think, that kind of help bring us to a place where we can understand why this story is is so beloved, but also why this story should be on the Mount Rushmore. I'm not arguing that it should be on Mount Rushmore. I'm just saying maybe we don't understand it. So let's back up a little bit. Let's zoom out. And let's visit something the Apostle Paul writes. About 30 years after all this, he's writing to a church in a place called Philippi, and he's talking about who Jesus is. And this is what he says about Jesus. It's in Philippians chapter 2, and it goes like this. God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Now, to understand what Paul is saying here, we need to put ourselves in the mindset of ancient people. And this freaks people out a little bit for us for me to talk about this. Just, just go with it. Just accept it. If it freaks you out, quit. It shouldn't freak you out. So when I talk about the universe, and I say, like, the cosmos, you guys have a very specific idea in your head of what that means, Right? Like, we live in the year 2022. We understand, uh, you know, that we are on a planet. And that planet has a moon. And that planet is part of a solar system. And that planet is, and that solar system is part of a galaxy. And that galaxy is part of a universe. And there's all sorts of planets with all sorts of moons. So we understand that. And we understand there's things like comets and asteroids and, you know, a whole lot of black space in which nothing happens. Like, we understand that's what the universe is. Cool. Paul didn't understand any of that. Of course he didn't. This is 2,000 years ago. Leave him alone. There's a really good chance that everything I just described is going to sound really stupid in, like, 2,000 years from now. Like, we're going to discover, like, oh, man, we had this all wrong. (laughs) Totally wrong. It's actually like this sort of how astronomy works. For ancient people, the way they understood the world, 
was that there is this place called the Earth, and that's what everything revolves around. That's what the whole world, that's all, all of reality, everything in the cosmos is all about us. And the universe actually is a three-tiered universe. Think of it like a house. The main floor is the earth. Of course it is. We're the important ones. We're the center of everything. There's stuff above the earth. It's called the heavens. There's the heavens. And there's stuff below the earth. Sometimes the names were given for that too. But there's stuff above the earth. There's stuff below the earth. And then there's the earth. It's like a house with three stories. It's a three-tiered universe. It bothers people to know that Paul thought this. <laughs> that Paul has no idea like, uh, that that's not the way the world works. But remember, Paul is a guy whose education exclusively comes 2,000 years ago. I understand theologically he's writing inspired works by God. But God did not inspire his astronomy. Did not inspire his science class. So, what does it mean then? Why am I telling this? Because Paul says that Jesus is at the place of the highest honor and gave him a name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, above the earth, on earth, and under the earth. Paul believes that the universe is comprised of stuff above the earth, the earth, and below the earth. When he says above the earth, the earth, and below the earth, what he's saying is all the things. Everything. Everything that is the universe. Everything that is the cosmos. Everything. And what he says is that the Everything, the cosmos, the universe, above the earth, below the earth, on the earth, Jesus is Lord of all of that. He is the Lord of the earth. He is the Lord of whatever's below the earth. He is the Lord of whatever's above the earth. Because to Paul, Jesus, on a fundamental level, is the Lord. And there is nothing. There's nothing that's outside of him being the Lord. He's Lord truly of all. That's Paul. About 30 years later or so, eh, give or take, depending on how we want to date things, the last book of the New Testament is written. John, Jesus' best friend, sequestered on this island. Those idiots in Rome gave him a pen. Instead of just not letting him write, they're like, ah, write all you want. What's the worst that can happen? Could you write a book that's critical of the empire and would last for two centuries? For 2,000 years? No, surely not. They were wrong. That is what he did. As John writes uh, what we call the book of Revelation, he actually adds a whole new wrinkle to this. A whole new addition this concept. This is what we read uh, in the, the first chapter of the book of Revelation um, from, from John and you know, Jesus, really. It says, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings in the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn from him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. So Paul says that everything in like the physical reality belongs to Jesus. He is the Lord of all the stuff in the physical world. And now John writes this letter. 
And he basically makes a timeline. So Paul is the three chief universe like this. John is making a timeline like this. And he says, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and he's the end. And what's hilarious is we spend so much of our time thinking about and arguing about beginning and end, right? If you think about, like, the arguments in the church for the last couple thousand years, how many arguments revolve around Genesis? How many arguments revolve around Revelation? How many arguments revolve around, like, how we came to be? How many arguments revolve around, like, what's going to happen in the future, right? Like, we just, like, that's our favorite thing as, as, as Christians to do this. And yet, according to John, Jesus is the Lord, at the beginning, whatever it is, and the end, whatever it is. Jesus says, I was, I am, and I am to come. I don't know what that means other than this. Jesus is the Lord of the past. Jesus is the Lord of the present. Jesus is the Lord of the future. Whatever it is, however it is. Paul says that Jesus is the Lord of all physical reality. John says Jesus is the Lord of time, eternally, backwards and forwards and now. These descriptions of Jesus are all adding up to one very simple sentence. Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord of everything. There is nothing outside of his reach. He is the Lord of the past and the future and the now and the heavens and below the heavens and, and, he's, and all the asteroids and all the comets and all the planets and all the moons and all the solar systems and, and all the galaxies and all whatever. Like now we think there's more universes. Cool, Jesus is the Lord of all that too. Great. Great big multiverse. There's like, you know, 10,000 gurus preaching in 10,000 churches throughout the multiverse. Jesus is Lord of all that stuff, too. <laughs> Maybe in one of those universes, I'm the shortstop on the Cincinnati Reds. They're probably still in last place, to be real honest, especially if I'm the shortstop. It doesn't matter what it is. What the writers of the New Testament are trying to tell us is that no matter what it is, Jesus is Lord. And that's why the calming of the storm is both so important and so terrifying to the disciples. You see, Jesus calms the storm, it's pretty clear, not for the benefit of the disciples, not because he needed to, not because it helped anybody. You know why Jesus calmed the storm? Because he felt like it. That's it. He needed to get some sleep, and his disciples won't let him. And the easiest way was just to make it stop storming. If it stops raining, then you'll leave me alone. And that level of power is terrifying. It's terrifying, particularly for men for whom Jesus is their friend. Jesus is their rabbi. Jesus is their teacher. When they eat breakfast the next morning, they're going to eat breakfast with the guy who has such unlimited power, he can decide what the weather is on a whim. In the middle of the night, half asleep. You want to mess up that dude's eggs? I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's being nice to you, but he said cheesy eggs. You're out of the American cheese. All we got is pepper jack. That doesn't melt very well, guys. It's not very melty. Got any little chunks in there? Yeah, Jesus likes spice, but he wants his eggs to be smooth. I mean, these guys hung out with Jesus every day. Every day. He is their Lord. For him to be the Lord. It's a game changer. And I dare say that as Christians today, we need to come face to face with this game changing idea. 
I can't tell you how many times in my life I've heard people talk about Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Let me tell you, Jesus is not your personal Lord and Savior. He's just not. Jesus isn't your personal anything. That's not how Jesus works. This dude created reality. He ain't your personal anything. And that's why I love the song we close with every week. Full disclosure, the real reason we close with this song every week is because back in the day, we were meeting at the high school. When I first showed up here, it was about the year 2002. Um, and we were at the high school, and we had these two lovely ladies, the two Lindas. And I don't know why they did it. I have my suspicions as to why. But uh, I don't know why they decided. They decided we were going to close the service with the same song every week. For them, it was, what a mighty God we serve, was their song. They decided that's what they were going to do. And when I first encountered this, I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. I just did. Come on. We're singing a different song. What are you doing? Sing a different song. And it took like a month before I was like, yeah, that's just the song we sing at the end. That's it. Hook, line, and sinker, it got me. It was, the, it was just like, it was, if you wanted to explain what Ashton Christian Church was, it was, we sing this song at the end of every week. I don't know why. It just became this thing. Like, like, it's such a, like, this, the church was, it's just so simple, right? Like, we're not trying to be fancy. We're not trying to be anything other than we're not. We like this song, so we sing it every week. And if you don't like it, find another church that's fancier. And I loved it. Oh, I loved it. So when we moved over here and I started doing the music uh, for the Lindas or with one of the Lindas and, and all that, when I started doing that, uh, I was just like, man, we got to come up with a song. And we 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 went through a few songs, and then we came up, then we came, we came across this one. And here's what I love about this song: this song lays out everything we've been talking about. This song talks about over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. It's not really until the chorus that Jesus is our Lord at all. It starts with an admission that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus can calm a storm like that for no reason other than the fact that he feels like it. Jesus is the Lord of everything above earth and everything below the earth and everything on earth. Jesus is the Lord of the past and the present and the future. He's the Lord. And he's not your Lord. I love that phrase, reign in me. It's like a king, like, Lord, reign in me. It's us Say it's a prayer, really. I accept you are the Lord, and I think that's great. And in faith and in love and in appreciation for what I understand you to be, I want you to be my Lord now. Not my personal Lord, but I want you to be the Lord in my life. I can't think of a more beautiful or more Christian sentiment than recognizing that Christ is the Lord and now we want him to Lord in our lives. He is the king. We want him to be our king. He is the one in charge of everything. We want him to be in charge of us. And I can't think of a better way to end any service than that song. And I actually love the fact that we do it every week because of my good friend Pontius Pilate. This is what we read in the Gospel according to John about the death of Jesus. It goes like this. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called the place of the skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to a cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that many people could read it. Then the leading priests objected, and they said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews to, he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, nope, what I have written, I have written. Now, I love Pilate because he's so petty. He doesn't like that the, that the Jews have put him in this position. He doesn't like what's happening. And so to stick it to him at the end, he's going to say, yeah, Jesus is your king. 
Suck on that. I'm translating from the original Greek language. Goes through the Latin, the original popes. I don't know anything about that. Here's what I love about this. Pilate declares that Jesus is the king. And Pilate doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe it. Even a little bit. Not even close. <laughs> like, not at all. But he said it. See, we've been doing this whole series. The songs we sing. I was thinking about it this morning when we were singing, uh, I Will Follow You. And I don't remember exactly what the line is. It was basically like, even if I die, I'll follow you. And I'm like, do I believe that? Like, when I sing that song, do I actually mean it? Here's a spoiler alert. Not really. I mean, I want to believe it. Like, I want that to be what I believe. Um, I would love for it to be what I believe. But if I'm being honest, like, could we just skip the death thing? And I'll just be an old man and live my life, and it'll be great. But we can do that. I think if we go through the song, the, the songs we sing, I think what we'll find is we don't often believe what we're singing. But we know we should. You see, there's so much truth we don't believe yet. Or we sort of believe. Or we know we should believe. And what's so wonderful about singing in church is because it provides an avenue for us to sing words and sing truths that we know we should believe and we don't really right now. And we want to believe them and we don't really. But we're working on it, maybe one day. And that's where Pilate comes in. Because Pilate doesn't believe that Jesus is the king of anything. He's just messing with the, or the, he's just messing with the Jews. But church history tells us that Pontius Pilate became a Christian. <laughs> My favorite thing. Not only he becomes a Christian, he becomes a saint. He is Saint Pontius Pilate, which is the dumbest sentence in the world. The man who executes Jesus becomes a saint. Because that's how the gospel works. That's how love works. That's how forgiveness works. That's how God works. And Pilate proclaimed it before he believed it. There are some weeks I want, as I sing, Lord, reign in me, I want Jesus desperately to reign in me. And some weeks I wish he'd keep his hands off. And there's some places in my life that I am so glad that Jesus is the Lord of that part of my life. And there's some places where, like, I just want to, like, it's like with my dogs, when they're being real annoying, I just put them in a room and I shut the door. By the way, that's why parenting is not the same as having a dog. I get so annoyed when people are like, Bah, having dogs is like the same as having kids. I'm a dog mom. No, you're not. You have a pet. You can leave your house and put them in a cage. That's not the same. If you do that with kids, you get arrested. That has nothing to do with the sermon. That just came out of me. But there's so many times, like, I, I, there's so many pockets in my life, I was like, I want Jesus in that room, and I'm going to go to this room. But see, this song defies that. Jesus is the Lord of everything. Over all the earth, you reign on high. And so we sing, okay, we pray. You are the Lord. I want you to be the Lord in my life. And sometimes we mean it, and sometimes we don't. That's the beauty of singing, is we proclaim truths that maybe we don't want to say out loud in words. So we sing them. And the, the hope is that the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of Christ, the infinite, infinite love of God can make somebody like Pontius Pilate, Saint Pontius Pilate. Ah, well, I didn't, I, I, to be fair, I, a lot of times I'm like, well, I'm worse than that guy. I'm not worse than Pontius Pilate. I didn't literally kill Jesus. If Pontius Pilate can be a saint, well, I can make it through tomorrow, huh? And so those are the songs we sing. The end of our series and the end of 
That's why you know why we sing that song now. It's super good. Think about it every week until you forget, as you do all of the sermons. I forget them all, too. It's fine. We're in our eighth week of our series called uh, The Songs We Sing. And our last lesson as we talk about the calming of the storm and Pontius Pilate and there's a whole mess of other things is this. Jesus is Lord, period. End of discussion. In faith, we live out that he is ours. Jesus, objectively speaking, whether we believe it or not, is the Lord. So we live in faith as if he is ours. The musicians are going to come forward. They're going to sing a song. I'll bet you know what it is. We offer an invitation each and every week to take God up in this offer to say, you are the Lord. I want you to be the Lord in my life forever. In baptism, we align ourselves with Christ. The Bible teaches we're to repent to be baptized. To repent is to change our minds. To be baptized is to align ourselves with Christ. Christ died. He rose from the dead. He is the Lord. And in baptism, we follow him uh, for the rest of our lives, uh, no matter how we feel, no matter how things are going. Um, you ever made the decision? We got a baptism tree. We can do it anytime. I'd love to talk about that. If you're in a mercy believer in Christ, looking for a perfect church home, this place ain't it. But we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up. We do it. And we want to be people who recognize that Christ is the Lord no matter what. And therefore, therefore, we live out his lordship in our lives as well. As we stand.